welcome. It is a beautiful Sunday morning, and we are so thankful that you guys are tuning in with us this morning. If you're new to East Point, we want to especially welcome you, and we want to invite you to fill out our online Connect card. This is a great way for you to get to know us a little bit, and we get to know you as well, and just build this connection. So go ahead, fill that out if you can. And for those of you who might be joining for the very first time, we just want to say that we have our online hosts ready Mm -hmm. to chat with you throughout the entire service this morning. So if you have questions or you just want to say hi or tell us where you're tuning in from, go ahead and chat with our host this morning. Yes, please do. We would love to chat with you. And if you are new, if this is your first time tuning in, you can go ahead and comment new in Mm -hmm. the comment section just so we can say hello to you. But here at East Point, we truly believe um, that it all starts with one simple truth, and that Mm -hmm. is that Jesus died for us. Mm -hmm. He conquered death so that we can have a relationship with God, so that we can walk with him here on earth, so that we can spend eternity with him in heaven. And we are so grateful for that. Mm -hmm. And John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And that word whoever in there is something we really do believe. Yeah, Anyone can have this relationship with God because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And that's also true um, for all ages, from Mm -hmm. kids um, to adults. And we have our kids ministry here at East Point. And it's our desire to share the gospel um, with kids. Yeah. (laughs) And they're just so fun and so joyful. And our volunteers spend so much time with them. So we just want to let you know that uh, Children's Ministry is open right now. You can go ahead and register for that. You can head on over to our app or to our website. Um, But it's open for all ages right now, even infants. So It's true. It's true. And guys, if you haven't had a chance to meet our Children's Ministry directors, um, Matt and Emily, They are some of my favorite people. They're amazing. Okay, just (laughs) like I love their (laughs) heart for kids and establishing a relationship Mm -hmm. with Jesus for these kids. And so, um, yeah, again, register uh, starting at 1 p.m. today. You can register your kids to come and participate. We're super excited for that. I do want to welcome Jerry um, or Gary. I'm sorry. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing (laughs) that right. But welcome. And we also have our online host, Ray Ray. So again, feel free to um, chat with us this morning and Mm -hmm. just let us know how you're doing because we're one big community here and and we love to hear from each of you. So Mm -hmm. um, one other thing that I kind of wanted to share is we have the Point Community Center, which we love. We love having this space and creating opportunities for community connections Mm -hmm. and um, One of the biggest blessings, in my opinion, and I'm sure you can agree, Mm -hmm. um, that comes with the Point Community Center is that we try to establish partnerships and relationships with other people who are serving our community. Because again, Jesus calls us to love and serve, Mm -hmm. and that's our goal here. And we actually just recently kind of partnered, um, I don't know if that's the right word, but Mm -hmm. but we came alongside um, an organization called Mainly Teeth. And Mainly Teeth is an organization um, that has been started uh, by Amber here. And her goal here is to bring dental care across the state of Maine in a mobile cart. It's amazing. Yeah, a truck, trailer, thing yeah, on wheels. Exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> her goal is to bring dental services to those who may not have access. And so... She sees patients from all walks of life and um, she's able to serve them and serve them genuinely and make them feel um, loved and cherished. And so what's cool is that we are trying to help her with donations, meaning um, toothbrushes, floss, and we could all floss more. Side note. It's true. It is true. Um, Toothpaste, all of those things. But she especially needs um, some donations for children's dental care. So Mm -hmm. soft bristle brushes, say that five times fast, (laughs) soft bristle brushes (laughs) and, um, more of, of dental care for kids. So be sure to grab some of those the next time you're out and about, and you can bring them back to our love crate that will be available in the foyer. Yes. mm -hmm. It's awesome what they're doing. We are so excited to be able to come alongside them. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And yeah, here's some cool pictures. That's yeah. the Love Crate if you're not sure where to bring donations. So we're excited to be able to um, help them out. Yeah. But right now we are in our Restore series. Mm -hmm. And man, it has been so good to yeah. be able to go through the, the book of Matthew together. Um, and I just still, the, the sermon from a couple weeks ago where we were just talking about how no one is too far gone, I just, that resonated with me yeah. so much. And I know so many other people um, who were watching and um, that's the message of Jesus, which yeah. is really cool. And we get to see um, Jesus throughout the gospel of Matthew mm -hmm. want to restore people, restore people to himself. And um, he's against those who are trying to get in the way of that. Yeah. And so we get to go through this series together um, and really get to experience Christ together. Mm -hmm. We have a little clip from this week's message. So go ahead and take a look. This was not a should you choose to accept this mission moment. There was no opting out, they were already in. It was more like, God bless, good luck, I hope you make it. And for now, they all would make it. Of course, Jesus would never wish them good luck because there's no such thing as good luck. There's only the Holy Spirit and he's real and he's with them. So don't ever worry about wishing anybody good luck. There is no luck. There is the Holy Spirit though. And if the Holy Spirit goes with you, uh, you don't need luck. You have the presence of God. Jesus gives them more specific instruction as they head out with the gospel, but he also gives them enormous authority. Authority in the Holy Spirit, which helps them a lot after hearing what they would face in the field. And we too have been empowered with the authority of Jesus, with the power of Jesus, but we need to get to know Jesus well in order to hear from him well so that we can understand how to use the authority that he's placed inside of us. Because you can't just march out and use the authority of Jesus without knowing the one who's the author of it. Without the one who, who is that power. Knowing Jesus well and listening well. I specifically love that part of last week's message just because... I love the fact that we have the Holy Spirit within us mm -hmm. and with that power in us, we are unstoppable for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And I, I know for me personally, I don't think about that often enough right. and that yeah. can really limit how I live life, but also mm -hmm. how I share the gospel. Like, I think that I just get inside my head yep. and I forget that the, the same Holy Spirit that was in the disciples that Jesus blessed them with, we mm -hmm. have that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just so cool. And like, like they said, you know, there's no luck about this. Right. There's nothing like that. It, it's a power by God that we have to share his gospel. So, right. So good. Yeah. So good. And I, I think that whole concept of, um, it's such a cultural thing to mm -hmm. feel like we need luck or we need things to yeah. go well. And, um, we're always hoping and wishing that things will go our way, but Jesus gives us something completely different where it's like, no matter what happens, yeah. um, no matter what comes, he's with us. And mm -hmm. that is so comforting because life brings a lot of ups and downs, but we can, we can hold on to the fact that, um, God will never leave us nor forsake us. And yeah. he's always with us. And yeah. Amen. So comforting. Wow. So comforting. <laughs> it really is. It truly is. And for those of you who may be just exploring your faith and you're taking these very first steps, I just want you to know that we are praying for you and that we are fully expectant that God is going to move in your mm -hmm. life. And if you're continuing to seek him, he's going to show up because yeah. he cares for you that much and he desires this personal relationship. So as you're listening to mm -hmm. today's message, um, just be expectant that God will do something in you. God will move. And mm -hmm. um, I also just want to encourage you to like, if you maybe don't know about Jesus and, and you're not really sure yet, you know, um, the book of Matthew or any gospel yeah. book is a great place to start to get to know the character of Jesus because he is the only thing that remains consistent. Yeah. He is the only person who is going to remain consistent. And I love getting to explore who he was in ministry. And the book mm -hmm. of Matthew does such a great job laying that out for us. And so go ahead and watch the previous messages yeah. from this series if you haven't already. Because again, we're learning who Jesus is, mm -hmm. how he came to restore 
that is always his mission is to restore us back to him. And so we just want to invite you to get ready for today's message, prepare your hearts, and let's join our team in worship this morning. Good morning, East Point family. Good morning, folks who are joining us online. We're going to sing a new song this morning called House of the Lord. And the charge in this song is to choose joy because this is the house of the Lord. This is where the Lord lives and also the Lord lives in us. We house Jesus inside of us so we can be praiseful for that. Let's worship. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted in the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Give it up for a God. Oh, 
child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb. Chosen me, love has called my name, and I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no Amen. Let's come before our Father this morning. Father, thank you. We just thank you. There are so many joys to count in our lives. Um, and we thank you for each and every one of you. This morning, I ask that you would just give us the strength to choose joy. And to choose a joy that is found in a deep and loving and meaningful relationship with your son, Jesus. We thank you for giving us access to Jesus inside of us because of the act on the cross. We thank you so much for that sacrifice done unconditionally out of love for me, for all of us here, for all of us online. We thank you so much for that. I ask that you would use us as vessels of love for greater Portland, that you would strengthen each and every one of us in boldness 
to share your gospel, whatever way that looks. Your gospel is so good. It is so redeeming. It is so life-giving. It is full of freedom and hope and joy and love. And it is so worth it to tell those who don't know about your son, Jesus. So we thank you for the privilege of being your children. We love you. It's in your heavenly name we pray. Amen. Were creation suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified Were the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We'd hear Christ be magnified. Let's sing this out together.
Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified. Amen. He is so worthy of our praise. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us online. You may be seated. Hey, good morning, fam, and praise God that we're able to gather together today in person and online. Right now, we have the opportunity and privilege to continue in worship by giving back to the one who has given us life. All through scripture, God calls us to give with surrendered hearts. He calls us to give our first and our bests. In number seven, we read all about the offerings that God's people brought to the altar. They were called to bring their best lamb or goat or their finest flour and oil. And the craziest thing is almost all of these offerings were placed on the altar and burnt. Talk about giving with a surrendered heart. When we give to God with our hearts and hands wide open and with no strings attached like they did in the Old Testament, we get to now see the kingdom of heaven grow right here in Greater Portland. Mark tells us all about the widow who gave an offering of two small copper coins only worth a few cents. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So whether you have little or much, God has the most unique way of multiplying our offering and blessing our obedience. So let's pray for that now. God, we just thank you for your presence here today. You are Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end, and we are just so thankful for your presence in our lives and your love. God, we just present these tithes and offerings to you and ask that you would just multiply them and bless them in only a way that you can do so that your kingdom here will be known by everyone. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew 10, 34, Jesus says, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn. Nothing on earth can bring about the kind of newness that Jesus has to offer. Without him, our lives will remain in pieces. But Jesus came into this broken world to make us whole again. He came to do more than just fix. He came to nourish. He came to fill. He came to set a new table. He came to restore. Hey, welcome back to Restore, everybody. Great to see you guys, as always. Great to have you online if, if you're watching online. I just got to tell you one more time, you, you are so deeply loved by God. I just got to tell you that. You just need to know it over and over again. If you feel like you are walking uh, kind of alone or in some other place and you don't have that connection that you need, uh, God loves you so deeply. I think you'll see that today in what we're going to talk about. And as I've said in the past, there is nothing I want more for you than to know Jesus, just to know him, just to walk with him and understand him and, and deepen your heart with him as I want to deepen my heart with him and continue to move in a direction that allows us to understand the depth of that relationship with Jesus is what brings us the freedom that we need regardless of our circumstances. And we're going to talk about some of those today. So maybe you can recall a time in your life when you were so sure of something that nobody and nothing could sway you about that assurance. Perhaps you were absolutely certain about a belief or a choice, but then more of life started to happen. And what you were so certain of started to get faulty and started to shake and and what once was a strong decision that seemed so absolute starts to give way to doubts and second thoughts. Maybe even questioning God about that decision or about what it was you were 
so certain of, and that's what happened to the man in our story today. But Jesus is in the business of restoration. That's what he does. And he restores hearts that even doubt God, especially in times of uncertainty that comes for so many reasons in this life. And so you can bank on the fact that Jesus will restore your soul and restore your doubting soul if you have doubt. You can open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11 or you can follow along on the screen. Either way is just fine. We're going to pick up exactly where we left off last week. And uh, when Jesus sent his disciples out into the world, here's what happened next. Matthew 11, verse 1. When Jesus had finished giving these instructions to his 12 disciples, he went out to teach and preach in towns throughout the region. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the Messiah? that we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? That's kind of a surprise to hear John ask that. For some of you, this will be the first time you've heard about John the Baptist, whose story is famous because John prepared the way for Jesus. He was the forerunner of Jesus to get Jesus introduced to the people. He was preparing the Jewish people for the Messiah And of course, for us, the Christ, the anointed Son of God, sent to save the people from their sins. We are the people, we're the world that he came to save from sin and death. And John the Baptist also broke the 400 years of silence. You you remember that? There were 400 years of silence between the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the Law of Moses. And then when Jesus came on the scene and brought the New Covenant that saves us in a completely different way. But there were 400 years of silence on the earth where no prophet had spoken. And John the Baptist breaks the silence. He was so popular that people from everywhere came out to hear him because they had never heard a live, true prophet speaking words. All the people had heard were the words that came from the scriptures that that they had heard read to them. And so when the people came out to see John, what they saw was a wild and woolly looking man sporting a camel hair jacket from L.L. Bean. And and he had a few other things that were making him look like a survivalist. He had bug wings in his teeth and honey in his, his beard because of his natural diet. And he shouted this message, repent. For the kingdom of God is near. That's what he just kept saying that. Repent. For the kingdom of God is near. But John was also famous for a divine humility. And you may not have ever thought about that. Maybe you remember if you know anything about John. That he, he said that he wasn't even worthy to untie the sandals of Jesus. And he immortalized the phrase... He must increase, but I must decrease. That's what John said as he was so wildly popular, which further magnified his humble heart, saying these things, which for someone so popular, drawing such huge crowds could be a, a rather difficult heart posture to even maintain. But perhaps the most famous of all things that we know about John the Baptist was that Jesus himself insisted that John baptized him. And John tried to say, no way. I can't even untie your sandals. I can't possibly baptize you. But Jesus would take no for an answer, wouldn't take no for an answer. And uh, so John baptizes him. And when John baptizes Jesus and Jesus comes up out of the water, John hears the voice. He first of all sees the Spirit of God descending on Jesus in the form of a dove, and then he hears the voice from God saying, this is my son whom I love, and with him I'm well pleased. John, was, John the Baptist was part of all that. So with all those things that make John so famous, why do we now find John, the once confidence forerunner and speaker, Asking questions that reflect doubt in his life. Doubt that Jesus is the true Messiah. 
Well, that's what prison can do to you. It can break you down. It can cause a lot of doubt. And John was in prison. There's a lot of un unwanted time on your hands in prison. And you can replay the story of your life over and over and over again all day long in prison. He was thrown in prison about a year prior for openly rebuking the adulterous and incestuous marriage of Herod, the Roman appointed ruler over Galilee, whose popularity polls obviously took a dive as a result of John confronting his incestuous and adulterous relationship. And we'll share a little bit more about Herod, this ruler, who got himself in lots of trouble because of his partying. Note to self, how many know you can get in trouble when you party? Only one of you. And so I, I know because none of the rest of us are going to raise our hand. But thank you very much for that, that hand of acceptance that, yes, indeed, if we party, we'll screw up our life. And that's what happened. Herod did that. We'll talk about it. I can't wait to tell you. It's a great story. So John is thinking a lot. He's wondering if his life was a waste. And he's wondering if Christ really is who he said he was. Is, are you really the Messiah? Prison will do that to you. Of course, it doesn't have to be a physical prison, does it, that sends us into the depths of despair or leads us down the path of depression. How many know we've been imprisoned without being behind bars? A lot of us have, and some of us are at the moment. And Satan, by the way, Satan is the one who will use whatever he can to keep you in one of his many prison cells. That's what he does to discourage you and give you cause for doubt and give you cause for giving up and give you cause for despair, give you cause for throwing away relationships, give you cause for just walking out, give you cause for so many things. Satan does that, not God. Satan's the one who does that. And I want to ask you a question. If he's using one of his many devices to distract you, to keep you focused on your perceived obstacles for growing, which keep your eyes off of Jesus. What is Satan using to do that to you right now? If your eyes are not on Jesus, then they're on something else. If your hope is not in Jesus, your hope is in something else and it'll always disappoint you. Any hope that's not in Jesus is flat out gonna disappoint you all, every time, all the time. No doubt. It's important not to get trapped, and as we'll see, Jesus is the one who frees us, and I'll go as far to say, Jesus is the only one who will free you. Nobody else. There's nobody else who can free you. You can go to any psychologist and counselors, and I'm not downing them. I am one. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not that bright, but I, I, I have done some counsel, and, and you know what? It's, uh, I can't free you, but Jesus, he can do that. You'll see and hear it later. It's Jesus who says, come to me. That's Jesus. And the reason he says it and the very reason we should listen and go to him is indeed because lasting freedom and purpose and joy is found in Jesus. Even if you have an obstacle right now that you're facing and it's keeping you from him, you need to move around the obstacle in any way, shape, or form that you can, even if you have to dive under somebody's legs to get there and grab a hold of Jesus' ankles and hold on. To fix our eyes on Jesus. So let's take a look back at John's humanity where we may find ourselves more often. And my hope is that we make it our goal to find ourselves less often, relying on our humanity, that is. And let's commit this morning to fixing our eyes on Jesus and going forward today to make it our ceaseless mission to deepen our relationship with Jesus, which requires you getting into the word and seeking him in prayer and not forsaking that any day of the week. Don't, don't forsake it one day of the week. You'll miss part of the relationship. Just get into the word. Have that chair time. Wow, Jesus does all that for us. And in us, he moves us into this place of freedom. But that doesn't mean 
Oh, listen to this. That doesn't mean what we face will be free of challenges or suffering or even some of the why questions that we may never get answered this side of heaven. How many of you have some questions that still are unanswered this side of heaven? And I just want to encourage you, they may never get answered, which means you need to put your trust in Jesus. Got to trust him. What are you going to do? Say, I ain't going. I'm not going to move. I don't want heaven. If you don't tell me the answer, I'm not going. You you aren't going to say that. You can't do that. So here's what we know. John was Jesus' cousin. They were born close together. He heard all the stories from his mother Elizabeth of when they were kids and the time spent with his Aunt Mary and Uncle Joe. Do you know who Aunt Mary is? Jesus' mother. They were cousins. They grew up together. They did life together. They fellowshiped together. He understood there was a divine direction on his life from God. His mom and dad told him so. Remember Zachariah and Elizabeth? They were old (laughs) when they had John. I love this story. So divine approval from God for his words and his mission, as well as all the famous four points that we mentioned earlier. But here John is, he's doubting and he's depressed now. What he hears about Jesus doesn't even fit his expectations anymore for who the Messiah should be. He gets reports that Jesus is acting kind of weird and he's hanging out with prostitutes and tax collectors and he's going to parties. What, this is not the Jesus that I knew. He's not my cousin. What's wrong with him? He's hanging out with the people who are on the streets doing the things we say not to do. Doesn't sound like Jesus. And what's even more troubling for John is why hadn't Jesus come to rescue him yet? Why hadn't he come to bust him out of jail? Why didn't he go to the bail store? You know, you've seen the bail places and you got to go in and pay somebody. Why didn't he do that? I don't want, I don't. I don't, I, let me say it this way. I know we don't want to hear this next part. That's why I'm a little hesitant, but I'm going to tell you. Being set free doesn't always mean being removed from our challenging circumstances or our challenging environments or from suffering. It may not even mean that you get removed from prison. And sometimes I know it's true that we need to break free. I get that. Sometimes we need to leave. But here's how Jesus responds to John's doubt-filled questions. And he's telling John's disciples in verse 4, Jesus told them, go back to John and tell him what you've heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. So this is going to sound like great news to John. It's going to sound familiar. John's going to say, now that's the Jesus that I recognize. And there's going to be a bunch of people to back up what Jesus is telling him, that there's good news being preached, the deaf are being made to hear, people are being healed and brought back to life. And John recognized that Jesus is quoting a prophecy from the prophet Isaiah. And for us, that would be Isaiah chapter 61 that shares this good news about the Messiah bringing good news and and binding up the broken and, and helping the poor. But Jesus leaves out one important point that John is listening for from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 61. And it was this. It was Isaiah's prophecy to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. But Jesus never quoted that part. It was sort of an indictment and an indicator that John wasn't getting out of prison. 
even though Jesus could have gotten him out. But as we said, Jesus doesn't always remove us from our challenging circumstances or environments, yet he still brings freedom. Here's how we know it, because freedom is found in Christ alone. Not through breaking free from our prisons even. We think it's going to bring us freedom. But then when we get out, we go, huh, this ain't so different than being in. What's the deal? Why don't I feel better after having done this or said that or gone there? It's found in Christ alone, our freedom. And even if you're in prison in any way, shape, or form today, freedom is still found in Jesus And John will literally die in prison. But let me say this, he will be free. See, this is so different. It's so counterintuitive. Like John's in prison. He's going to die in prison, but he's going to be free. In fact, he is free as soon as he recognizes who Jesus really is again. His head will be cut off at the request of a dancing girl and her mother. King Herod the drunk's own wife and stepdaughter who took advantage of the king's high spirits while he was partying at a big party that he offered. And during the party, he saw this little stepgirl dance and he was so enamored with her. He said, I'll give you whatever you want, sweetie, up to half my kingdom. And so she runs to her mommy and says, what do I need to ask for, mommy dearest? And she said, John the Baptist's head on a platter. That's what happens when you're drunk or high. He was too smashed to recognize the irrevocable decision that he just made regarding John, whom he was growing rather fond of, by the way, and wanted to hear more from and would send for him often because he wanted to hear what he had to say about the good news and about the Savior, Jesus. I mean, it was all going really well until he got a little drunk and The twitty little dancing girl put herself out and asked for something he could not take back once he granted it. It's how his life would end. It's the evil on the earth that seems to get its way, allowing Satan to claim the victory. But let me make sure you hear this. Satan never wins where Jesus reigns. Satan never wins. That's right. It's true. I don't care what you've been through or what you're going through. If Jesus is on the throne of your heart, Satan will never win in you. But you, not the people around you, you have to make Jesus Lord of your heart, Lord of your life, Lord of everything, and me too, so that when Satan comes against us, we know he won't gain the victory. That's the deal. It's true no matter how you try to describe it. And Jesus' words would ultimately restore John's heart to the truth that he really is the Messiah, and John would be set free in his heart, but not free from a physical prison cell, nor the escape of certain death by the guillotine. But John would never taste death because those whose hope is found in Jesus never die. And we say that over and over from here. Your body's going to die, but you never will if you're in Jesus. Your body will die. You won't die. Your body will die. You won't die. You'll never taste death if you're found in Christ. Otherwise, you'll taste every single bit of death, and it'll never end. That's hard news. Our difficult circumstances here on earth can seem eternal, but they are temporary because our life here is temporary, but Jesus is eternal, which makes our life eternal. See how different this is? It's so not the world. It's so opposite. He will bring not only freedom to your soul for eternity, but may free you from some some of the challenges that you're stuck in here. It's not that Jesus won't give us freedom or help us through a tough relationship or get us out of a jam or help us in a bad situation or with school or with a job or whatever. He often does that for us. He works on behalf of those who love him. He just does. That's what the scripture tells us. Your better choice to follow Jesus is your best choice ever on this earth. Your best choice ever. 
So John's disciples head back to give a report, and when they leave, Jesus gives this confident testimony about the spiritual heart and the strength of his dear friend John the Baptist, whom he loves so much, as well as his cousin, right? It's a really strong word about John the Baptist from Jesus. Here's what he says in verse 7. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began talking about him to the crowds. Listen to what Jesus says. What kind of man did you go out in the wilderness to see? Was he weak? Was he a weak reed swayed by every breath of wind? Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No, people with expensive clothes live in palaces. Were you looking for a prophet? Yes, and he is more than a prophet. John is the man to whom the scriptures refer when they say, look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you and he will prepare your way before you. Jesus goes on to say, I tell you the truth of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist, yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. Oh, we'll cover that last statement. It's quite exciting, actually. We'll get to it in a moment. But imagine Jesus saying this about you or me. Imagine Jesus saying about you that among all who ever lived, there's no one greater than you. Among everybody on the face of the earth, you're the greatest. It's what he says about John. There's no higher or greater endorsement or accolade that one could receive. The Grammy Awards, the Academy Awards, the Tony Awards would pale in comparison, wouldn't they? If Jesus said about you, you know what? There's nobody on the earth like you. You're amazing. For most of us, that would just be our imagination. A sheer impossibility. But Jesus goes on to say something shocking at the end of verse 11, and here's what it is. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. Now, how can this be? Well, it isn't because we're better than John. We're not better than anybody. We're just not. We're not better than John. So Jesus must be speaking about another kingdom, and he is. But when and where does that kingdom begin? How about the moment you say yes to Jesus? That's when the kingdom begins. Not later. Now. When you say yes to following, to surrendering your life to Jesus, to making him our king, our ultimate savior, who becomes our immediate friend, think of this. We become immediately filled with the Holy Spirit when we make that choice, he's immediately in us because he instantaneously comes to us, living inside of us. That was not true for John. John did not have the spirit of Christ living in him, not in the way that we have. And what happens to us when we say yes to Jesus? The blood of Jesus covers every single bit of our unrighteousness. That was not true for John in the same way it's true for us. See, we didn't live under the old covenant. John did. And the law. We live under the new covenant. It's called the wonderful grace of Jesus. And the wonderful grace of Jesus moves in to a place that nothing and no one else can move into. And that grace cleanses us. We say the blood of Jesus washes us clean, don't we? Nothing else does that. He pours his grace out on our dark and putrid sinful condition, which he turns into a justified and sanctified heart and soul. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the dark, pukey mess that's me. And he pours his grace out on me and makes me clean. He watches. Yeah, that's right. All freely given upon our repentance, our acknowledgement of our sin problem and our sin nature. And then you know what he does. He replaces our sin nature with his Holy Spirit nature. Call that a replacement. You know, that's, that's better than any other replacement on the earth, isn't it? that he gives us a new nature 
he calls us a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Even in prison, if you're in prison, that's what happens if you come to Jesus. So is it a kingdom now or a kingdom that's coming? The answer, yes, of course, both. The tension is intentional but hopeful. We live in the tension when we think about our continued temptations or less than it used to be sin, but it's still sin nonetheless. Occasionally sin leaks out and breaks forth and we need that same grace to cover us over again. And he does that amazingly. That's why it's called amazing. And even in our depressing circumstances, or our struggle to accept something that we don't want to accept, all the while knowing there's a coming kingdom. What we can't accept very well here on the earth will one day be no more. We won't even ask to accept it. We won't even think about it anymore. We'll be in a new place, new kingdom, an eternal home. There won't be a single stitch of sin or pain or depression that we know in that new heaven and that new earth. We've said it so many times. Yet in the tension of the earth and the new heaven and the new earth, we have Jesus now who frees us now, even when we're, we're not removed from our horrible circumstance. So here's my, my, my encouragement to you is, is whatever obstacle is in your path, uh, you just must, you must wrap your arms around Jesus. Whatever is holding you back, whatever is your struggle, whatever is your heartache, whatever is your grief, whatever is your soul-stricken issue that's just ripping you apart, you must hold on to Jesus. And even you say, but I don't know what to say and I don't know how to accept it. I don't understand how I'm supposed to. You just keep holding on to Jesus and that's all you can do. You don't have to say anything. Just hold on to him. Sometimes just get with him and hold on to him and don't let go. Just don't let go. Don't let go. Don't, don't think by letting go and holding on to somebody else for a period of time that that's going to take care of the problem. It's not going to take care of the problem. They'll listen, they'll help, they'll counsel, they'll advise, but it's Jesus. And by the way, we do have some great counsel and great advisors among us. It's what we do for each other. But Jesus, you hold on to him, and I promise he won't let you go. Nobody, he, he's, he's not going to release you. Is it possible that Jesus has a confident testimony of you and me? That's the question. Oh, yes, is the answer. Is it possible Jesus has a confident testimony about you and me? When we deny ourselves and put ourselves to death and take up our cross and follow him, when we place our trust in him like we just spoke of, even when we don't know anything about how that's going to play out, when we trust in Jesus' name, Asking him to use us and make us and mold us into whatever helps advance his kingdom. Whatever is for not only our own salvation, but for the hope and salvation of somebody else. When you and I start thinking like that, that it really isn't all about us. Remember when that phrase was really popular, it's not about you, it's not all about you. Well, it's not, and it's still not about you or me, but Jesus doesn't forsake us while he's using us to help somebody else. And it might be your pain or my pain that advances to do that. So yes, it's possible that Jesus' testimony about us is confident and affirming for it's by grace we've been saved and this not of ourselves, it's a gift. So we've said that. It's possible to live out kingdom values now. Please hear me. Don't settle for worldly values. They are pathetic at best. You and I can live out kingdom values right now Every value you see in Scripture that is of God, you and I can live that out right now. You don't have to be violent or hateful or, or full of revenge and full of bitterness. You, you and I don't have to claim those things. If we do that, we'll end up doubting like John did and we'll miss the joy like he almost did. So in the remainder of this chapter, Jesus reveals the people in that day don't have a taste for the kingdom of God and nothing satisfies them, which sounds like 2021. They all said they were waiting eagerly for the messianic kingdom, the kingdom Jesus was bringing. And when it came, they responded with violence, which also sounds like 
2021. We already saw it with John the Baptist in prison facing certain execution as the one who was preparing the way for Jesus and his kingdom. And the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the pastors just like me, were the ones who would stand in the way and keep people from finding out who Jesus really is because they were holding on to their traditions and to their laws, which was absolutely a disgrace. If you think, why are you shouting at me? Because pastors still do it today. And pastors who are in love with fame and in love with themselves and all the other stuff, and I pray I'm not and I don't want to be, and it's never something I choose to, and if it was better for me not to be here, I I think I'd go, okay, that'd be better. But I just want you to know Jesus and him crucified. I want you to understand what he did for you. I want you to accept him. I want you to love him and let him love you back. But the prostitutes and the tax collectors, this is my favorite part, they saw Jesus differently than the Pharisees and the pastors, the religious leaders. They were saying, that's right. That's what I'm talking about. He's the Messiah. He loved me unconditionally, and then he saved me. Prostitutes and the tax collectors had better theology than the teachers of the law. They humbled themselves, and it's why Jesus could say to the religious leaders, the arrogant pastors who loved fame more than Jesus, that the prostitutes and tax collectors were entering the kingdom of God ahead of them. And the truth is, most of them won't even enter. That's the deal. And Jesus goes on to list the many cities in which he performed many, many miracles, and even his hometown, Capernaum, who saw the most miracles but believed the least in Jesus. And he warns them, and he tells them what he said last week, It'll be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. And then Jesus says in chapter 11, verse 25, at that time Jesus prayed this prayer, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. The wise and the clever in their own eyes, those with high opinions of themselves and their intellect, who prize themselves on their own gifts and their own talents and their own whatever, to see and hear things that obviously other people can't. It's not that Jesus is calling them ignorant. They knew about a lot of things. They just didn't know God. They weren't ignorant. They just didn't know God. And Jesus refers to those who humble themselves as the strong, that in their weakness, he's strong for them enough to rescue them and enough to save them. Oh man, this is so powerful. Let me share what he says next. Then Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. And isn't this a welcomed invitation for the hurried and the worried? Jesus said, in me you'll find rest. And strangely, the rest comes when you take his yoke upon you and his yoke is actually a tool for doing work. How can you use a yoke to to find rest? This is how. It's, It's voluntarily, eagerly coming under the piece of equipment, the yoke that's used in farming to keep animals walking in harmony with one another, making the load easier to manage. And Jesus said, come underneath my yoke. It doesn't exempt us from work or difficulty or suffering. It doesn't mean 
effortless. You're not just going to float with Jesus. It means when you come under Jesus, his yoke is suitable and it's fitting and he has crafted it for you and me. It's amazing. And then he works through things with us. It's doing everything we do with Jesus and him with us. And then we move in tandem with him. We're never out of sync with him when, we're, when we have his yoke. He's always perfectly in sync everywhere I move, every direction we go. It's perfect with Jesus. It doesn't mean my life is perfect. It means he's perfect and I cling to him. He shares our sorrows and our joys and the emphasis is on him. Not you and not me. The emphasis is on Jesus and he says, come to me. Will you is the question. And why wouldn't you is my question. Why not? whatever you're facing. So the action point that you can take with you today is to come up under the yoke of Jesus. Let him bear the burdens with you and walk in tandem with you. And then you won't have to blame everything on everybody else or feel like you're alone or or wonder why nobody cares or nobody's setting you free from prison and nobody understands what you're going through and all the, how many know that we could say that every single one of us could say, you don't understand anything about me? It's true, I don't. You wouldn't want to try to understand everything about me. There's no way I'd want to put that on you. I'm a wreck. But I'm in Jesus. That's my hope. It really is. Let me pray for us and then we'll share the Lord's Supper. Thank you, Father, for loving us so much and thank you God for teaching us through John the Baptist who was such a great man, a forerunner for Jesus and then he, he ends up in prison, he's full of doubt and he's like we would be and then you make it really clear that our freedom's found in you our hope is in you we trust you, we give ourselves over to you today, and that's my prayer take us as we are Lord let us Come up underneath your yoke so that we can walk. This life, even today, will become better because we're with you and you're with us. In your name, amen. If you have your communion cup, let me just share with you. A yoke is typically made out of wood, right? And a cross is not usually made out of neon lights. It's usually made out of wood. But the cross is not really a yoke, although you could see like a couple of animals could be tethered to the inside pieces of that cross back there. And, and you know, you've seen them with the chains and everything in the wild, wild west, and, and they move forward. But that's not what that instrument represented. It was a yoke of sorts. But it wasn't for anybody to join Jesus in. took the weight of the world, the sins of the world, and nobody carried it with him. And most of the people who saw him just spit in his face and hurled insults while he bore the weight of their sin on that cross. Amazing, isn't it? There was no tandem. Do you realize not even God, his father, was in tandem with Jesus on the cross. You know why? Because God cannot be where sin is and he separated himself from his own son. That's what he did for us. That's what we remember. Let's remember his body broken. Let's share the bread. And then this blood, this represents the blood, the juice represents the blood that cleanses us from all sin. Let's, let's share the cup.
And as you're able, we'll stand, we'll worship.
There's a place for me And it's heavenly At the table with the king It's the real thing It, it so is the real thing his love is. And if the only Jesus you come to is the get me out of a jam Jesus, he might leave you in the jam so you can get to know him. <laughs> His mission isn't just to get you out of a jam. That's called a soap opera prayer. Oh my God, help me. Or a desperation prayer. But he's not a get me out of the jam Jesus at all. He, he loves you every minute of every day, every second, all the time. When you're eating pizza and laughing, when you're cheering your kid on from the sidelines, he loves you all the way through. <laughs> when you're standing over the casket, he loves you so much. Through all the pain, through all the suffering, through all the joys, through all the victories. He loves you just the same. So if you'd like to give your life to that Jesus, he'll, he'll put his yoke around you. He'll start walking with you in, in tandem. But don't get ahead of him. You won't be able to. You see his yoke's on you. You'll, you might try to break free, but his yoke is on you. But you have to take his yoke. That's the requirement. If you'd like to pray with somebody underneath our screens on my right and left, there are our prayer team. Just join them. Let them know. If you've decided to give your life to Jesus, let them know. They'll help you. If you want to call or text the number on the screen, we have people who are ready to just talk with you about what it means to walk with Jesus. And then if you want to know more about who we are and where we came from, stop by the Discover East Point room on your way out if you're in this room right now. Um, and Keenan will meet you there and give you a little more information about who we are and uh, what your next steps could be with this church family. It's great to see the room a little fuller, isn't it? And uh, yeah. We'll still do what's required of us, but I can't wait. Till the requirements change and we'll do our best to march through that and uh, thank you guys for being attentive today being in this with me and us together as we look to Jesus have a great rest of your day we'll see you guys next week it's Mother's Day <laughs>